Hey there YouTube guys and gals. Welcome to your next installment on mouthpieces. As promised, we're going to be talking about how mouthpieces are made and finished. Um, now I'm going to show you how I do it. There are different ways to approach uh, finishing mouthpieces and so on. Uh, but I think what I'm going to be showing you is pretty much the traditional way. It's the way I learned from Everett Matson and from Ken Legacy and uh, other people who were very, very fine mouthpiece makers and craftsmen. And I'm going to uh, show you some of those procedures right now. In measuring the mouthpiece, I uh, measure the, the top of the window. I measure the bottom of the window to see what the width is. And then I measure the total length of the facing. And I also examine the facing for any kind of uh, particular flaws any chips uh, and uh, take, make note of the thickness of the rails and the thickness of the tip. After I measure the width of the top of the window, the bottom of the window, and the length of the window, then um, I'll go back and check the bore with a plug gauge. I don't have my plug gauge to show you, but it's simply a tapered gauge that fits up into the bottom of the mouthpiece. Up in, I'll show you up, in, up into the bore of the mouthpiece like this. And if the, uh, if the bore is too small, if it's very tight, a real pea shooter, then I'll definitely uh, take it on a lathe and ream that bore up. The next thing I'll do is get a total length on the mouthpiece. This mouthpiece is just short of 90 millimeters long, 89 millimeters long. That's right in the ballpark. Next, I'll measure the facing. Measuring the facing, I use a reading glass like this it helps me plot the resistance curve. Once the resistance curve is measured, I also measure the facing uh, tip opening by using this very high precision facing gauge. I also use these guys. These are feeler gauges and they have di different thicknesses and I drop them down between the glass and the facing and the different thicknesses give me an idea of how long the facing is or how wide the facing is at that particular point. The gauges also help me do one other important thing and that is they help me to know if the mouthpiece facing is crooked at any point. If the mouthpiece facing is crooked my gauges will not drop in perpendicular but they will drop in at some kind of angle so that will tell me that one rail is shorter than the other at that point. In uh, my mouthpiece world uh, when uh, facings are crooked, they have to be corrected. Now exactly what do all these measurements do? Measuring the bore and the facing curve and uh, the window sizes and total length and stuff. Do they tell me I've got a great mouthpiece? No, they don't tell me I've got a great mouthpiece on my hands. But what they do tell me is if I've got a bad mouthpiece on my hands or a mouthpiece that has serious flaws that really need to be corrected in order to play properly. You can't always calculate a great, a great mouthpiece, but you can always detect when you measure a bad mouthpiece because it'll have, uh, it'll have objective acoustical flaws that need to be corrected and when they are corrected the mouthpiece will play much much better. It's going to be very good once it's corrected properly and it may even be great. In facing mouthpieces I use a very very flat stone. You have to make sure that it's flat otherwise you'll never get a good flat table never get a good finish on that table and that's so very critical and I use a number of abrasives. Uh, this abrasive for instance starts at 1500. Uh, some of them are a little lower. Uh, this uh, looks a little rough but it's actually a thousand grade which is quite a bit finer than the, the grade that, uh, that <laughs> grades that you'll commonly find on the market and then um, beyond that if I desire a really high polish on them I have a whole number of other abrasives that go all the way up to 8,000 and 12,000. So this enables me to get a good seal on the mouthpiece and a high polish if that's what I desire. Now in facing the mouthpiece, um, if the mouthpiece is too open at the tip, then I have to start by taking down the flat table. And uh, this is done by simply lowering the table like that and as the table goes down the curve of course gets shorter and shorter and the tip gets closer and closer. So I don't begin the refacing of the mouthpiece until the tip 
is closer than I want it because I'm going to open it back up and lengthen the curve back to where I want it to be. Um, and once that's all remeasured and voiced properly, uh, then I'll finish it and uh, we'll have a, a good playing mouthpiece. Let's assume now that uh, we have a tip, the tip uh, closer than I want it. Then um, I might start with the 1500, I might even start with the 1000, and um, probably with the 1000. And I'll start by beginning to face the length of the curve, the full length. And this is the bottom part of the curve. And then this is the middle part of the curve. These are all subtle movements, and now I'm moving up into the tip. Sometimes I'll have to split the abrasive. For instance, I'll take two abrasives of the same type, and uh, one will be the cutting abrasive, and the other will be simply a polishing abrasive, and I'll split it like that so that I'm only going to be cutting this rail, and this one I'll be polishing. Say if this, if this rail were too short and needs to be lengthened to this rail, so I'm only lengthening the, the left rail here, it turns into the right rail when you flip it over, and uh, I'm not really changing the, the, the facing dimensions of the right rail. Once the mouthpiece is faced, I might decide that the, that the rails are way too thick, the window's gotten smaller again, the tip rail's gotten thicker, and uh, then I'll have to work on the mouthpiece. I'll be using files like this to do that kind of work, uh, to go in and and change the window size and diminish the size of the rails. This will help any given mouthpiece blow freer with a bigger sound, um, but it'll also degrade the sound uh, if you get the window too big for the, the focusing powers of the interior. Another thing that uh, I would use, I don't have these tools to show you, actually I have to do one of these tools to show you. Um, this is a baffle tool that I made myself you grind it and sharpen it and you can go in and you can you can work on the baffle to change the shape and the contour and the depth of it uh, to improve uh, the color and the sound and uh, also um, to uh, get a little more flexibility in the sound if, if you decide that's what the mouthpiece needs. Now after the mouthpiece is finished, after the facing and the bore work and everything's checked and double checked, then the mouthpiece will be very, very carefully tested under very controlled circumstances. Sometimes I'll use a master model if I'm making a particular type of facing so that I get consistency from, from uh, mouthpieces to mouthpiece of the, of the same type. Well, uh, I hope uh, this gives you a little idea of the kind of process that mouthpiece makers go through in finishing mouthpieces. Um, Daisy, Daisy's making a lot of noise over there. Okay, all right. Um, I'm being called, okay? The awful voice of love is calling me, so I'm going to have to uh, sign off. Thanks for watching. Uh, again, if you have any questions, any suggestions, really like to hear them. And also, gracious Daisy, and also, um, uh, please uh, log into our website, take a look at our stuff if you get a chance, and um, subscribe. Remember that yellow button right up there? Subscribe so you'll automatically get all our new videos that come out. And I hope you enjoyed this one, and I hope we're giving you helpful information. Let us know your interests, let us know your questions, and we'll try to address them uh, one video at a time.